Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 and record your name and affiliation. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn today's meeting over to Dan Hewitt. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Hey, everybody. This is Dan Hewitt with NASA Public Affairs down at the Johnson Space Center. and We are here to talk to you today about BEAM. I'm joined in the room by a couple of folks who will be able to take any questions that you have. I have Jason Cruzan, the Director of NASA's Advanced Exploration Systems. I also have Lisa Kalk from Bigelow Aerospace, and then Kenny Todd, our Operations Integration Manager for the International Space Station Program. Jason's going to get us started with a quick overview of how the operations went yesterday, the reviews we've done today, and where we stand in the forward operations. And Kenny will give a quick overview on the station itself, and then we'll open it up for questions. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Jason. Thanks, Dan. I just want to first walk you guys through our, um, the whole process that we were going through yesterday with the expansion of BEAM. Um, yesterday, we started the expansion of BEAM in the morning, early hours, and uh, everything was proceeding as nominal um, during that expansion. The first uh, steps in that expansion process were um, the closing of the ascent valve. These are the valves that allowed um, the interior beam to be exposed to the vacuum of space during ascent, during launch. Those valves um, were the first thing to be closed. The second step was the cutting of the uh, restraint straps, the three straps that you see around the outside of beam, holding it in its uh, launch configuration. And the last step was the releasing of a bolt. Uh, bolts that connected the forward and aft bulkheads um, and allowed them to then be able to be expanded. Um, all three of those events occurred nominally and as expected and we've been able to positively confirm that all three events occurred and um, none of that um, is, uh, no, no doubts of those uh, events occurring. Um, when then we started into the, the fourth step of the process which was the manual inflation uh, um, valves being opened for a period of time. We went through a sequence, stepping up the pressure um, through a series of opening and closing of that valve. Um, and, and our crew member, Jeff Williams, was doing that. We were closely watching the pressure um, rise uh, over that period of time. And what we were looking for is a pressure to volume ratio. So we, as, as we watch the pressure go up, we expect the volume to increase. And at the beginning of that, uh, that's exactly what we saw. As, as pressure went up, we saw volume increase, and as that pressure would drop, and we would expect that over uh, over the entire expansion, um, seeing that effect. We ran into uh, higher forces than we believe uh, our models predicted, um, and what we were seeing is we were approaching pressures that um, weren't part of our modeling effects that we saw. Um, so at that point in time, we decided to stand down the pressurization operation, leave beam at its uh, pressurization that was at at that point in time, and let it sit overnight uh, while we went back to our models and refined that data. When actually we came in this morning and met as an engineering team again, we did see further expansion of beam over the evening hours, both in the axial and radial directions. We did see small movements in both directions, uh, which is a very positive sign uh, as well. As we're going through the engineering data today, um, we made the choice to go ahead and go through a decompression or depressurization process. Uh, what we're expecting to see out of that is a relaxation of the structure inside of beam, the fabric structures, and then um, that will allow us to then pick back up, uh, hopefully uh, actually planned as early as tomorrow morning, uh, to walk back through the pressurization sequence again. Uh, we believe this depressurization depressurization cycle uh, will allow some relaxation in, in those forces um, and the fabric to shift around and, and be able to step back into that uh, sequence uh, first thing tomorrow. Um, I think I'll leave that uh, as my opening statement and turn it over to Kenny. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, BEAM, uh, it's, it's one of these uh, technology demonstration kind of items for us. and. Uh, uh, thus far, we're we're definitely learning a lot. Um, it uh, you know we knew going in that uh, there were some things on station that we would have to watch out for relative to uh, to uh, um, expanding this module and 
and uh, and, and the team has done a great job at uh, adhering to the constraints and the requirements that were in place to ensure that we took care of station while we went through this process. So so everybody's done a real real nice job and and uh, the engineering and, and safety and ops uh, folks along with the Bigelow team have, have continued to uh, to look at the data and, and to make sure that uh, uh, where we can, we can uh, relax some of our thinking about how we approach the, the uh, getting, getting the module expanded, but at the same time, again, doing a really nice job at, at making sure we take care of the ISS. Uh, from from a, a go forward standpoint, no no issues for, for the station itself. Um, everything, uh, the crew can, can perform normal activities. They can have a normal weekend set of things. They're, they're not constrained in any way, shape, or form relative to what they can do on station. Um, we'll, uh, we'll have the crew work a little bit tomorrow to, uh, as we try to, uh, to go through the process to, to see if we can get, get, uh, get the beam expanded over the weekend. Um, as far as some of our downstream activities, uh, mostly unaffected. However, um, uh, if we're still in this state early next week, we've got some robotics activities that, that we currently have on the plan that, um, that uh, uh, we would rather not do if we, uh, we still have a, what I'll term a partially energized uh, beam module, meaning that, uh, meaning that there's still some, some, some pressure within the module. So we'll, uh, we'll come to a, a decision point here probably sometime after tomorrow where we'll, uh, we'll have to decide um, if we want to, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, take the air back out of the module again if we don't get it fully expanded tomorrow and, uh, and so that we can, uh, we can not have that energy in the system and, and, uh, and then we can move ahead with some robotics activities early in the, in the week. Um, and the thought there is that um, if, you have, uh, if you have some air in the module, uh, in the beam module, and it's, it's somewhat pressurized, that uh, if we're moving the robotic arm around and getting close to structure with it, there, there is, um, uh, I won't call it a concern, but at least a constraint in our minds that, that we wouldn't want to have that energy sitting in the, in the beam module and then have it react, uh, you know, essentially have the, have the module expand, if you will, and put some force back through station and, and uh, cause the arm to, uh, to vibrate and maybe hit structure when we didn't intend to. So that's something we'll We'll uh, we'll deal with uh, uh, after tomorrow if uh, if we don't get where we want to get to tomorrow. So, but that's a trade in the near term we'll make. Um, and uh, again, that's the only thing that I can think of right now that that has any any bearing on where we end up with beam um, over the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, but uh, again, largely largely unaffected. ISS in good shape and crews in good shape. So, um, that's uh, I think that's all I've got in terms of the front end. Okay. So with that, we're going to go ahead and start opening it up for questions. You should be getting notes from your operator, but again, if you want to get into the queue, you're going to have to press star 1 if you do want to ask a question. Yes, at this time, we'll begin the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, it is star 1. Make sure your phone is unmuted. Record your name and affiliation to introduce your question. Withdraw that request, you may press star 2. Once again, for a question or a comment, press star 1. One moment, please, for our first question. And our first question or comment is from Joe Palka for MNPR. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. So my question is, um, you said that you saw the beam expand overnight. Uh, can you say how much? And the second uh, question is, uh, you, you've now determined you're going to deflate and reinflate. Does this just mean you're going to push forward uh, with stronger pressures because you're confident that that's what's required? Or are you going to hope to see more movement with the slow, small amount of air to put in at, at, at the start? Yeah, so Joe, I'll, this is Jason. I'll, I'll give you some more specifics on that. Um, when we ended uh, operations yesterday, um, we were at about 96 inches in diameter, um, and we had moved the axial uh, distance out the bulkheads from each other at about five inches. Overnight, um, they settled it into about 100, um, and we had another inch of uh, axial movement outward of the bulkheads overnight, uh, resulting in about six inches of movement there. And I'll further add that um, even this morning, uh, we saw it, the radial uh, diameter move up to 111 inches, and the axial still stayed at six. 
Um, although we didn't, uh, obviously during that entire time period from stopping operations to this morning, we, we didn't add any more error in. And then we saw a corresponding drop in pressure as the volume was increasing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's uh, the first part of your question. Um, Related to the second part, do we believe we're going to need more pressure uh, than we got to? Um, we had uh, what well, we have kind of safe pressure curves that we wanted, and Kenny kind of talked into that. We we're talked about that is we we want to ensure that whenever we have the expansion event, that we don't impart any significant forces into the space station itself. Um, so the whole reason why we're being very careful on the pressure is whenever it does expand out, we expect it to be somewhat gradual, gradual out with a couple of energetic events as it kind of goes through its uh, unfurling process. But in no time do we impart the loads. So we had a very conservative pressure amount. We've actually reevaluated that uh, pressure level as a function of the, the volume that we believe we're at. Um, and in fact, we could have gone to a higher pressure um, even at our standpoint today. Um, we chose not to go to a higher pressure and instead go through a sequence of depressurization and then uh, look at different pressurization approaches uh, this afternoon uh, to bring it back up uh, tomorrow. So we are not sure at this point if we'll go a slow stepwise pressurization like we did the first attempt or a, a larger burst uh, or duration of air adding all at one time tomorrow. That's what we're evaluating. Um, to look at different options for the pressurization sequence tomorrow. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Um, why do you think that the beam is um, having such difficulty or a slowness in becoming longer? Um, it seems like you know it's expanding in one direction but not the other. Is it something mechanical or what's your best guess? Well, actually, uh, this is Lisa from Bigelow. Um, we actually purposefully did this slow, cautious, stepwise pressurization. Um, and so this is all, th the speed at which we're expanding the beam is determined uh, by when the manual inflation valve is opened. Um, so this was so that we could very, very carefully monitor the pressure inside and be sure at every step uh, that we could ensure station safety and that uh, we didn't, weren't imparting any loads on station. Uh, so this was all by design and uh, we, in our process, integrated a few steps where we stepped back and looked at the, at the data and that's just what we did yesterday. But uh, are, are you, do you think that the, let me ask you it this way, do you think that the beam is structurally um, okay or do you think that there might be some kind of flaw from having been packed up so long? Um, or some other problem? I mean, are you confident that there's nothing wrong with the beam at this point? Uh, yes, we are. Um, one thing we had to do when we were uh, creating the models that Jason alluded to earlier was to make some assumptions about the behavior of the soft goods on orbit. Um, because, of course, this is a technology demonstration. This is the first time we're expanding um, our habitat on station. And so we're getting a lot of data right now, actually, about how the soft goods are behaving and how much friction uh, is in the soft goods and how much energy it takes to move them outwards. Um, so that conservatism in the model, um, you know, put us in a, a place yesterday where we were, you know, seeing that the reality in the model might not quite match up. That's what we're evaluating. I see you, Marcia. This is Kenny. Um, you know, uh, the Bigelow guys, they, they've flown things before, but this is their first time to come to station and we put some requirements on them relative to trying to manage these, these loads that they impart to us. And so, in some ways, this was part of the learning uh, we, we went into on this particular flight. To be honest with you, it doesn't surprise me a great deal that we ended up here. Uh, we put a lot of conservatism uh, between, the, uh, between the, their their approach to the modeling and our approach to, to modeling it with them just because uh, we wanted to make sure that, uh, again, we went that extra little bit for on the station side. So it doesn't surprise me we ended up here. These guys have a good uh, a good plan for uh, for how they deploy these modules. It just happens to be the first one we've done on station and, and we we, uh, we added a pretty fair amount of conservatism in, into the way they deploy. So not, not a huge surprise. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Irene Klotz from Reuters. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, 
I have a couple of questions. Um, when will you uh, know today if an attempt tomorrow will be made to uh, expand the module? And if you go ahead with that, would uh, the whole full sequence of events that you were planning on doing yesterday take place, the pressurization and everything else? Or um, at this point, are you just looking to have BEAM um, extended? Yeah, so let me, um, yes, we, we plan uh, to walk through the pressurization sequence tomorrow. That is, that is a definite thing at this point in time. Um, it, it'll be slightly different than yesterday, the first three steps. Obviously, we don't need to recut the straps or release the bulkheads or close the valve. All those are actually still staying in their same configuration that they were. So we'll pick up that manual inflation tomorrow. The thing that we are protecting for tomorrow is that uh, we want to go through this whole pressurization sequence and also ensure that we have enough time in the timeline in case we want to depressurize again before the end of the crew day. Um, so we are starting early enough in the day um, to ensure that we have time for both uh, pressurization uh, from a positive perspective, making sure that we have time to get through that um, and do a nominal deploy like we had planned to do. Um, and then also protect um, and time in the crew day to ensure that um, if we have another um, off nominal kind of experience where the pressure is gaining again, um, we have enough time to also then depressurize and do go through another depressurization cycle uh, as well before the end of the crew day. Um, so we're, we're protecting for both of those options. But we will proceed tomorrow with another pressurization attempt. So uh, that's, that is for sure. You don't, it, at this point, there's nothing else that's going to happen today that may delay that. And also for Dan, is this going to be uh, you know, televised live on uh, NASA TV? So I'll answer the technical part of that and then I'll let Dan answer the public affairs portion of it. Now, we don't expect anything else um, today to um, uh, change uh, as far as our approach to go on the pressurization. Um, we will finalize the approach by which we do it, meaning how many bursts of air and how much time in between each of those bursts of air um, will be added in the sequence uh, and duration of those. Um, so that's the uncertainty part that we're working through with engineering uh, teams on NASA and Bigelow's side this afternoon and then uh, um, we'll pick it up uh, in the morning. And I feel I, f I feel special as the first time the public affairs guy's ever gotten a question on one of these. But yes, yes, we will we will televise it, and as soon as we get a time that the operation will kick off, we'll put out media advisories and all of the times that for when the broadcast will start. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Miles O'Brien from PBS. Your line is open. Hi guys, uh, I have a question about um, the timeline. Um, it, you could potentially, I suppose, have success tomorrow, but what are the limits uh, to uh, times you will try this and or um, is there some sort of deadline in orbit either related to the beta angles or something? How much runway do you have to play with this, in other words? Well, this is Kenny. Um, we, uh, again, if you look at the next 48 hours or so, we're heading into a crew weekend. We're going to take tomorrow. We're going to go do this. Uh, fingers crossed everything works out fine. If not, um, you know, we'll probably sit and scratch our heads a little bit about, you know, uh, what it is we want to go do next. Um, and uh, in the meanwhile, we have some other things on the plan that we'll probably go try to do. Uh, I mentioned them earlier, some robotics things. If we jump out into that, uh, we probably wouldn't get back to doing anything with uh, with Beam until the middle to the later part of next week, which is fine. It's not going to hurt anything. The, the module's just fine. There's there's nothing that's an issue there. Um, uh, we're going to have this module for a couple of years, so if it takes us a, a week or so working around on all the other things we got going on on station, that's going to be okay, and that'll allow the teams uh, the time to go continue to look at the models and look at the plan and decide if there's something. Uh, uh, another way we want to approach this. Uh, so, so short answer to your questions: no real, no real constraints relative to, uh, uh, you know, betas or any other in the environmental things we tend to have to worry about. And just to clarify, if if you don't have success tomorrow, uh, you will kick it down uh, by at least a week. You think because of the robotics issues? Well, again, I wouldn't call those issues. I would call them a plan. I mean, we could we could always make the decision. Uh, that's that's part of the discussion we'll start having to, tomorrow evening. But if if uh, if asked today to commit, what I would say is we have some robotics operations on on a starting Monday morning. 
that uh, that uh, we'd probably like to go go do those robotics operations uh, to support another another customer. And uh, um, again, I think the uh, if we're not successful tomorrow, I think that will give give the integrated um, uh, Bigelow NASA team an opportunity to to go off and and think about whether there's anything we need to do different uh, when we come back around again. And the first opportunity to come back around again and start start uh, trying to do something with the module will probably be around Thursday of next week. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Alex Knapp from Forbes. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking uh, my question. Um, this, I really just wanted to know about your expectations. Um, it, it sounds like uh, everything that, that proceeded yesterday was something that you'd anticipated, that things wouldn't fully inflate. Uh, but to, to look at um, some of the stuff that was put out beforehand, it seemed like you know everything was expected to uh, fully inflate and you know be be done yesterday so I, I guess what I'm curious about is were yesterday's results uh, a surprise or how long you know w were you expecting timeline wise to have a, a fully inflated beam yeah so of course we we always plan a uh, nominal plan is obviously success uh, oriented and, and all of our models and such we try to model our uh, get our best engineering understanding uh, of how these things will perform and actually operate in space but like we said, this is the first time we've done this. This is a demonstration for us. Um, so there's a lot of elements that were in our model that um, uh, were not actual based on data, but just uh, anal analytical models at this point in time. There's a couple of forces that we very clearly expected um, to be playing uh, uh, basically against the pressure we were adding. Um, we expected, obviously, we have some restraints inside, um, ripstop uh, uh, fabrics, and then also um, some uh, structure inside that also slides along the way to kind of attenuate that, any potential loads that are in there. Um, and those we can very well ground test the forces that it takes to overcome those and match that with the pressures that we are expecting to add. The unknown part is um, how this level of soft goods and the soft good interactions on itself um, actually happen in space, um, in the microgravity environment, in the uh, thermal environment that we're in there. And we have models for that, but obviously our models are different than what we're actually experiencing, hence the value of this actual experiment. So what, what kinds of things that happened in the, the test that you didn't expect, but more specifically? The primary force that we believe that we're working against is friction force between the fabrics. Um, and there's some multiple layers of friction um, that could occur at the different uh, levels in the module. And th those fabric friction forces, soft good friction forces, are uh, the part that uh, is most likely the contributing factor. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question or comment comes from Sergio Avila from NBC. Your line is open. Please check your mute feature. Your line is open. Sergio, go ahead with your question or comment. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I just wanted to ask about uh, as far as you know how confident you are that you'll be able to get this thing fully inflated, and uh, just if you could talk a little bit about once it is inflated, what's the plan for it then? What will be done? Yeah, so we're we're very confident that we will get it uh, fully expanded out at some point in time. Uh, hopefully, that'll be tomorrow. There's no signs of anything that um, that we've seen in the data that. Um, that, there's a, that the beam module deployment is at, at any risk at this point. It's just understanding the forces that it takes to get it to expand, and that's what we're kind of walking through in a very careful and measured way. In fact, actually, we're probably being extremely cautious on it because there's actually very valuable data that we're achieving by doing this in a very stepwise fashion um, that would help both us and Bigelow in the long term. Um, once we do get to a full expansion, though, we'll finish the outfitting, uh, which is deployment and activation of sensors in the inside. Um, and then there, the intended period of, uh, on orbit is two years, and over that period of time, we're going to be collecting critical data like thermal, uh, micrometeorite impact data, and uh, radiation data as well. Um, but to be honest, uh, actually the data that we've learned getting ready for flight and now as we're going through expansion uh, and operations um, is hugely valuable for us as we go forward with uh, any kind of expandable st structures in the future. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Mark Carroll from Aviation Week. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, I have, I hope, related questions here. But um, first, the, what was the pressure level that you reached um, Thursday that sort of brought you to a stop? And was that for the volume of the interior of the module or some other subset of that? And when you say deflate, um, did you deflate it all the way back to zero or some point lower than what it was Thursday, but higher than zero PSI? So the, the, yeah, the, the actual pressure levels we had um, uh, yesterday, it doesn't take uh, an absorbent amount of pressure to actually have it take its shape. Um, so we were at a very, very low pressure. I, I would equate it to less than, way less than 10% um, of its final uh, pressurized uh, uh, level that we'd have on the station. Um, and and it, it, because you're, you're only working against the vacuum of space, which isn't really against, um, it doesn't take much pressure to actually ex expand it out. Um, so we're looking at really, really, really low pressure levels, actually. And, and your second part of your question was, uh, I think, related to the volume. Um, and when we unpressurize it, um, and in fact, if, if there are any images uh, online or video uh, from station that just are on NASA TV in a general sense, um, if you looked at Beam today, we're actually looking at it right now, um, it still looks to be uh, pressurized. Um, even though it's unpressurized, um, because there's no forces acting on it to collapse it back into its folded state. It actually stays uh, basically at its state that we left it uh, when we took the pressurization back out. And in fact, this is why we're uh, running through this cycle, as we believe by cycling the pressure like this, um, some of the folds in the fabric will, uh, those friction forces, the actual pressure was actually increasing friction forces. Um, and by relieving the pressure, now we're seeing relieving of the friction forces. Uh, those fabrics will reposition themselves in some natural way. And we go through the pressurization cycle again tomorrow. They'll be in a different position than they were now. But I guess I just want to understand if you, if you do proceed tomorrow, which I understand you intend to do, will you be starting, as it were, sort of at the same condition you were Thursday, even though you have some expansion? Uh, and I understand what you're saying about vacuum outside. That not pushing on it or anything. It's internal pressure from the fabric. Yeah, so the, the bottom line is we will not be starting at the same condition as we started yesterday. Yesterday we started at vacuum, and we closed our ascent valve. Uh, it was the fir very first step that we started, and then we started from a vacuum. Um, we also started from a packed configuration. The straps had been holding uh, the soft goods down um, as well. There is a memory to some of these fabrics and, and soft goods uh, in that the longer time that they're not strapped down, they kind of respond back to their nor normal state. Um, so it, we are definitely not starting from the same position yesterday. And in fact, when we say depressurize, we are not taking it back to vacuum. Um, we're just relieving that stored energy, that pressure that's in the inside down to a very low level. Um, it absolutely will not be vacuum. No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Jeff Faust from Space News. Your line is open. Hi. The uh, press release that uh, Bigelow Aerospace announced shortly before this telecon alluded to the fact that uh, the beam had been uh, in storage for longer than expected prior to launch because of launch delays and that this might contribute um, to the, the problems you're experiencing. Can you elaborate a little bit about exactly what might uh, this uh, extended uh, storage in this is configuration might have contributed to these uh, deployment delays? Thanks. Uh, this is Lisa. I think actually Jason just covered that pretty well. Um, and primarily what that impacts is the uh, compression of the layers that you see on the outside. Some of those uh, layers have a memory to them, have materials with memory. And uh, the longer they're packed, um, you know, the, the more they're compressed, and then it takes a little while for those shapes to return. And so now that we've seen it um, in the partially deployed configuration for a little while, those materials have had some time to relax. Um, so this process of uh, depressurizing today and then going um, and returning to the pressurization operations tomorrow um, can only be helpful 
in allowing those materials to have some time to relax. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Jason Davis from the Planetary Society. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I recall that uh, you switched the method um, that was used to pressurize the module from an onboard tank to uh, the station's air. And I was just wondering if um, that had been in consideration as a possible cause for um, why this was turning out differently than your modeling. And uh, secondly, just a quick question, what are the robotics activities that are scheduled early uh, next week? Thank you. Yeah, so yes, um, the, the, the expansion process was changed in our original design. And in fact, actually, uh, uh, BEAM is still carrying the tanks of gas um, at, uh, on its interior um, as well uh, that we will use for the final pressurization. Uh, we switched to um, using um, station uh, available air to actually have a more controlled approach uh, during the initial expansion. Um, the, the control valves and the and process of the manual inflation and having a crew member there allow us a lot more controllability in that initial phase um, than we would have had otherwise. And, uh, but we will still absolutely still use those same compressed gas tanks uh, to reach final pressurization up to the station atmosphere. Um, so that it, it's, it, both of those systems are still in play for the final pressurization. I'll let Kenny take the other part. Sure. And then, that, the reason we had to go to that that particular approach, this more metered approach on the on the first phase, was to protect station. Had we just opened up the tanks and allowed the module to expand on its own, that's where, from a station program, we had concerns about loads being imparted to station. So these guys came up with a real nice concept to to basically meter it, meter it in, expand the module, get it in its basic shape, so that so that uh, we don't have to worry about a you know a, a big salvo deploy, if you will. If there's a buildup of pressure and then the module pops out, if you will, that could that could have uh, imparted a load in an area station that would would not have uh, not been beneficial for us. So doing this this more metered approach was was a really smart way to do it. Um, as far as what we have. Coming down down the pike, uh, for you, those of you that are familiar with our CubeSat program, um, we uh, we have another set of uh, deployers loaded uh, within the uh, Japanese airlock, uh, ready ready to go. And on Monday morning, uh, we'll plan to use the Japanese robotic arm and, and pick up that set of deployers. And and uh, over the next three days, we'll be uh, we'll be deploying a, a set of CubeSats. With a with a with a, a whole host of uh, different purposes. That conclude the question or comment. Oh yes, sorry. Thank you. Not a problem. Next question or comment is from Kenneth Chang from New York Times. Your line is open. Hi. Right, thank you. I'm sorry if I missed this, but at full inflation, how many inches does it move on the axial, and what's the final diameter? Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, we're just making sure we give you the right number. It <laughs> will be 73 inches of total axial movement uh, at full pressurization. And the diameter? It'll be 127 inches. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question or comment comes from Charles Fishman from the Smithsonian. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for talking to us today. I'm curious whether Bigelow has a version of Beam, uh, a, a similar, another one that has been compressed 15 months, sitting somewhere. I know sometimes you guys keep you know, operational models on the ground. Do you have any idea what has happened to that fabric in 15 months, or do you have something to compare it to? Uh, this is Lisa from Bigelow. Um, we, we don't have an exact replica of the beam on the ground, but we have done some materials testing 
Um, and so we do know what happens to the material when it's compressed for a while, and it's essentially um, what I was explaining earlier in that it has some memory um, and it takes some time for the materials to relax um, and to come back to their uncompressed state. Um, and so, of course, when the materials are compressed against each other, the friction to move them will be higher than when they're more relaxed um, and sort of spring back, if you will. Can you, just one follow-up, can you give us a little flavor, if we could, uh, here on Earth, if we could touch this material, what would it feel like when you, when you compress it like that? Is it like the heavy sail on a, you know, on a 40-foot sailboat? What's it, what's it feel like? How thick is it? How, how easy is it to fold and, and move and unmove? Uh, well, uh, the outside of the beam um, is a fairly standard uh, layup of MMO D shield material. Um, so there is some foam between the layers. Um, so of course, when that gets compressed, um, it's, it's a little bit more rigid and feel. Um, and, and so it, it does get packed down to the point where um, there isn't too much elasticity anymore to the structure. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's good. Th thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Mike Wall from Space.com. Your line is open. Thanks for for taking all these all these questions, guys. I appreciate it. Um, this is just a, a quick question. Does the fact that the that that it kept expanding, beam beam kept expanding overnight and even into the morning after you guys stopped inflating it, does that sort of I mean, is that what gives you sort of confidence that it's a fabric thing and that's just going to take a while to bounce back? I mean, how does that kind of observation play in, into this, this sort of working hypothesis that, that you're, you're settling on, it seems like? No, absolutely. You, you hit on exactly our engineering thought of what's going on. Um, we wanted to, obviously, with it basically creeping out and expanding further over a period of time under the same exact, exact pressure, uh, we don't believe we have any binding effects or any other secondary effects that are occurring in it. That's how we uh, eliminated uh, or, or came to the conclusion that we believe it's just the fabric friction forces um, working against it uh, and holding it back. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question or comment comes from Matthew Heyman from Space Technologies. Your line is open. Hello. Uh, I would like to, to ask one question. Uh, in case if uh, you will still have problem with uh, correct expanding beam, uh, do you consider any examining uh, module from outside during potential extravehicular activity? Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Kenny. Uh, that's that's not in the in the cards uh, to to do an EDA to to help this module out. Uh, again, I think the team feels pretty strongly that we're going to get there uh, with the uh, with the concept and the plan that's currently laid out. Uh, we'll just got to work our way through it. Um, in terms of getting creative with uh, other solutions, I, I don't think we're we've uh, we've put a lot of energy into that right now. But uh, I would tell you that. Uh, an EDA is is, uh, is is probably not not going to be part of that that uh, that thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Robert Perlman from Collect Space. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I apologize if I missed this, but if uh, if you are successful tomorrow with the full deploy. Uh, is the ingress still go for Thursday, or when would the crew be uh, first to go inside? Yeah, I think we'll have to revisit that whole timeline. Um, we had a pretty much an iron bar of days set up with, with activities occurring. We've got some leak tests or leak checks that we've got to do. Um, we got things like an 80-hour leak check that we have to do. So uh, I would, uh, at this point, until we reflow out the timeline, I would I would say it's probably doubtful that we'll be on the same schedule at this point. So what we'll, we, you know, unless unless we figure out some way to combine some activities, the, some of this stuff is just iron bar. The leak checks we can't cut short. That's going to be what it's going to be, and that's going to take us where it's going to take us. Okay, thanks. 
Thank you. Our next question or comment is from James Dean from Florida today. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Um, and, you know, I know with this gradual deployment you've been describing, uh, the you know, imparting loads on the station as, as your main concern, I was just wondering if there's also any concern about damaging the beam itself uh, with a more rapid deployment. You could, could this, is there a risk the fabric could kind of get jammed up or, or tear, or is, is that not really uh, anything you're worried about? No, we have no concerns for either the deployment or the safety of the beam hardware. Uh, our concern here is only with um, loads to station. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question or comment is from Ian Thompson from the Register. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Um, it's a couple of questions. First off, could you just um, be a little more specific in terms of the, the concerns on the load to the station? I'm a little fuzzy on as to how the big load module would affect the larger space station itself during an inflation. And then for a secondary, my understanding is that at the end of the two years, the beam will be ejected and be allowed to burn up. Is there a reason why it isn't being brought back? Okay, well, I'll answer the first one. Um, if you if you think about stations, stations uh, basically a set of, of mod modules and and trusses and a bunch of different appendages, if you will, and and where we put those modules together, those interfaces where we put modules together, um, we can only take so much load in those areas before we we run the risk that we're going to actually damage that interface. And if you look at the uh, the uh, uh, if you're familiar with station, node three hangs off of the basically the spine of the station, so it's kind of like an appendage that hangs out. Uh, where we're actually putting the beam on the node three itself, if for whatever reason we have a a force or a release of energy uh, down on that part of the node three, we could actually drive a load back, a side load, if you will, into the node three. That could uh, that could present a problem for us at the interface between the node three module and the node one module. And in other words, if you could kind of visualize it, like you're you're you can you know break a, break break off the node three from the node one if there was a strong enough force uh, on the on the end of the node three. And so that's that's what we're managing. And and again, uh, that's not going to happen. We've got a good good plan to go uh, ensure that we. Uh, that we uh, pressurize the, the beam slowly so that if we do have a, a release of energy down at that end of the node three that we don't have to worry about it impacting that, that point at which it attaches to, uh, to the node one. Does that help? That does. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. And as far as, yeah, we're going to hang on to the module for a couple of years. That's the agreement we have with Bigelow Aerospace that, uh, that's in, in place uh, at this point. Um, Unless something happens in the last 24 hours, I don't think we have a way to get it home. Uh, so uh, that's probably, uh, uh, you know, under consideration as well. But the agreement that was was made all along was to uh, to uh, um, basically let the module go, and it'll it'll end its life uh, on the way back in. Yeah, there's um, just a further add on that. Um, the reason, the primary reason, is um, once expanded, and you can actually. As we're going through this depressurization sequence now, there's no way to put it back in its fully stowed configuration once it's been deployed uh, in space. So there's uh, even if we had a vehicle that we could stow it inside and bring home, um, there's no way to pack it back up per se um, to bring it home. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final question for today comes from Trevor Kinsey from Cosmic. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone from California. Everyone, thank you for your time today. This is certainly an exciting opportunity for everyone involved with Beam and understanding that this technology is a demonstrator. If for whatever reason the module isn't able to be inflated, does NASA intend to keep it in stealth for the entire two-year mission? And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, if this does prove to be successful, which we're all, of course, hoping for, are there any further discussions on how NASA may utilize the module past uh, collecting data? So at this point in time, we don't we don't see uh, foresee an end that would get us to the point um, of not being able to get it expanded out. Um, so and there is really no um, as Kenny was talking about earlier, there was no there's no pressing case to get it off of that uh, docking port either. It, it, it's in a safe configuration, um, especially when it's uh, depressurized. 
Um, so we have uh, plenty of time to work this. There isn't some pacing object that it, beam doesn't expire. I mean, it's uh, it's perfectly safe there for us to work this um, in a very worst case scenario over a series of weeks. Um, so there's no there's no pacing uh, piece there. Um, as far as utilization of the module, our current intent was as a technology demonstration, um, and that's our planned path forward uh, for its utilization. We, we would especially, over the two years, we especially want some time for the module uh, that's quiescent uh, in order to just get the data as it, uh, uh, kind of in its raw format that we can uh, utilize and get the most engineering uh, use out of. Um, will that change in the future at some point and, and additional utilization? Um, We'll, we'll see how, how well it performs, and then we can make a decision to change that operational scenario. But at this point in time, we're not doing that. Perfect. Thank you, and uh, good luck, everyone. Thank you, and that was our final question for today. Okay. Well, since that's our final question, we'll go ahead and wrap up this. I want to thank. First off, all of you in the room for joining, joining me and for all of you on the line for calling in to ask your questions. Uh, just as a reminder, if you want to dial in and get a replay of this, you can dial toll free at 800-756-0584 and we'll also make a replay of this available on the web for folks to download if they desire. And again, since we will be doing another run at expansion tomorrow morning and it will be live on NASA, NASA TV, look for a media advisory and additional information out of NASA a little bit later this afternoon. So with that, thanks again to everybody for calling in. We'll give this another go tomorrow and that will wrap it up for our, our telecon today. Thank you. That concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.